Welcome to Working in the Industry, an in-depth discussion with executives and creatives from TV, film, and technology. So glad you guys can make it. Thank you to the panelists for being here. Thank you for the weather not being 90 degrees, because I've been in this room when it's 90 degrees. <laughs> and you're all lovely, but it's, it's, it's not pleasant. Um, we are going to talk to these amazingly diverse individuals. They work in different parts of where creativity and entertainment and arts and culture and av advocacy and activism meet technology in all different ways, and it's really exciting. The thing I want you to know about, who's been to my panel before? All right, a couple of, that is right. I've had, I have two repeat customers here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting, but new people. Who's a student in the audience? I have, <gasps> I cry. Oh my gosh, it's working, three years, and it's working. Um, we should be. So I don't know if you know, this is part of the University Project, which is a relationship that I developed with the president of Digital Hollywood, and I'm grateful for him to offering, not just to the Cal State, we've expanded it, but um, for college students like me, um, and many of us probably on the panel, and many in the audience, who were studying some aspect of entertainment arts or who wanted to break into the entertainment industry, and I work with students all the time now, so you hear, how do you get your foot in the door, you know, in the most competitive, challenging field? I know, neurosurgeons, whatever, yeah. But um, everybody wants to be in the industry, right? They think it's sexier than it is, but we know the truth. Um, it's sexy, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Go for it. Um, and that's why we're here. We want to hear from these guys. We want their stories. How did they go from campus to career? What did they learn along the way? What advice can they give you? But also, what are they working on? And how did they go from A to Z and, and, and be so successful in this challenging field? The other thing I do for my panels is it's really meant, it says discussion, it's a conversation. So if you have a question, and I'll pick my glasses up off the floor so I can see you. <laughs> Raise your hand during. I don't wait till the end for Q&A where I can take three questions and you'll forget your question from an hour ago. During, raise your hand and I'll try to see you and call on you and you can interact during the panel. Please, it's an interactive discussion. This is an entertainment conference. Can we please be entertaining? And <laughs> thank you, right? Maybe that's my own personal, like, why are they? No, everything's wonderful. So um, I made this show to be alphabetical, but the, as you can see, they're not sitting alphabetically. The reason why I do a slideshow is so it's very hard for people in the back to see these, right? Or if you forgot your glasses, like I always do. I'm new to glasses, it's very confusing. Um, so you can reference over there, but what they're saying is going to be a hundred times more interesting. But if you're taking notes, if you, I have no problem emailing you this slide deck. If you want to remember anything, you know, there's no secrets here we want to share with you. So this is an open discussion and dialogue. So Derek, welcome to the panel. Thank you. He's such an interesting man. Who's looked at um, the bios for some of these people before they showed up? Good for you. Because I don't want us to waste time on their bios. So I will display these things in the background. Whoops. So you can see, where is yours? Figures. Um, what he's done. But tell us a little blip about your background and Specifically, how you went, and I know, but how you went from where you were as a student, doing many interesting things with a many really interesting background, to where you are now. Okay, you want like the, the 30 seconds, the two minutes, the... Well, start with 30 seconds and okay. questions might come up and we might, might grill you for more. Okay, so the 30 seconds... I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. I went back for graduate school there doing a PhD, studying how trends in open source software map onto ideas of open source content. I then got recruited by some people in the industry, 
uh, namely Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics, to come and consult, uh, run BizDev at his company, consult it for big companies like Visa, Nokia, MySpace, Interscope. My, uh, MySpace one was still a, sh a thing. Um, <laughs> and then got recruited by Oprah, got recruited subsequently by Al Jazeera English before they had a version in the US, built content properties that were in 300 million households around the world, basically giving the audience a voice to decide what was news, what mattered to them. Then got recruited to do similar things by Disney and Univision, and realized that all of these people have no idea who's watching our stuff. I have, at one point had content airing in 300 million households around the world. We don't know who any of those people are. So I got with a couple of friends from Harvard, a couple of friends at Google, and built a technology that makes it easy for content owners to know who's watching and why. And that's me in about 45 seconds. That was pretty amazing. Was and and we're going to, yeah, <laughs> it, indeed. We're going to go back to um, more about what he's created now called Ampit. But there is a connection here to, of two panelists. Um, it's weird how you both got on this panel. but um, <laughs> Totally random. I don't know. Um, that would be his wife, Lucia. <laughs> oh. I know. And they're both incredible, like mind blown, incredible people with different interests, but similar interests and backgrounds. So Lucia, a little blip about yourself, and okay. then we'll look at, take back the mic and everything you guys have done. Okay, awesome. So uh, I grew up uh, in New York. I was a ballet dancer, got injured, became an actor, uh, went to Harvard undergrad, and then the Yale School of Drama acted in New York. Uh, Los Angeles and Europe in television, theater, and film. was cast by Oliver Stone, uh, moved to LA, and got uh, completely swept up in the Obama campaign. Uh, started a group of two volunteers that grew to 2,000 by the general, and we won for Obama by the largest margin in California during the primary. Um, during that time, met Derek, and we um, were vibing on this idea that you could kind of press fast forward on movement building using technology um, for great content, whether it be political or artistic. And um, so we uh, got together with uh, Jonathan Gramling, our other founder, and then we found our uh, chief technology officer who came from Google and LinkedIn, and um, that's how we got started. So you'll see, um, I took some stuff from your website, <laughs> so people can, so they can, you can discuss the two of you. And I don't, I'm gonna, um, this is gonna be interesting to me, to see who talks what about what, because I've seen, I've seen you pitch, I've seen him pitch to at a very exclusive Google venture fund event, and <laughs> they're amazing, and they're an amazing team. Um, Thank you. Which is just interesting because my life has gone from. The perform I met Lucia in graduate school and then gone, like, we're all digital now. We're all technologists. It's yeah. frightening. Um, so how do they know Ampit works? And this sort of explains your platform, if you would like to talk about it. And you'll see I have background where you can read it at the same time. You okay. decide. Sure. So when we first got together, like, we built the technology, and we're like, this thing can help you understand your audience, and you can do all these amazing things with your content. And so we're like, okay, we've built this platform, but we have no content. Great. So then we went to people who had content, we're like, hey, why don't you let us do da 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 da, -da with your content and help you understand your audience? And they're all like, yo, Starty Mix Startup, son, I don't even know you. <laughs> Get out of here with that. You can't touch my content. Hands off. <laughs> so we're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Like, we're dead in the water before we even started. So a bunch of us come from an uh, entertainment background. And so we were like, okay, well, why don't we just create a series that could showcase what it can do? And we got this big brand that was gonna put up close to a million dollars to do this amazing digital series. And they pulled out like a month before we were supposed to start. Like, and completely like nothing to do with us. They just ran like, oh, something, something, stock price, blah, 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 blah. We're cutting back a little bit. So, you know, maybe in a year or two. We were like, Yo, we have to do this now. Like, everybody's yeah. waiting. Mm -hmm. And so we did, literally did an Indiegogo. Wow. We did the Indiegogo while we were actually in production. Oh Two of a, a couple of us got on a plane <laughs> to Medellin, Colombia, one way trip. And no red started, flags there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and we had literally no return ticket, did this whole thing. And after three weeks of hustle, 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 we came back. 
and we edited something we called Take Back the Mic, the World Cup of Hip Hop. And the World Cup of Hip Hop was done in Brazil, Colombia, and Jamaica. It was a series that let you see the world through the eyes of young artists. Imagine Anthony Bourdain, but for music. And the cool part is, the, we didn't decide, like if I ask any of you right now, like who's the freshest artist in Medellin, you might not know. We didn't know either, <laughs> right? So we, took, we used the technology to enable the kids in those communities to tell us what was on and popping because Ampit lets you have a finger on the pulse of what drives engagement in real time wherever it is in the world. Uh, long story short, uh, that thing became a thing. It was more than a test. The band that won, you know, we, we met them in a favela outside of Rio. 60 days later, they're on the cover of the national newspaper, right? Within three months of releasing the property, we were a finalist for the Emmy for Outstanding Interactive Program. We lost to Taylor Swift. <laughs> As you did. Where is Kanye when you need him? <laughs> I'm just saying. Get out of the sunken place, bro. Anyway, but Kanye didn't save us. We're just chill, trying to shake it off. Yeah. And, uh, oh, you did it! <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> so, and and then we we did that. And people were like, "Oh my God!" Well, it was probably a fluke. I mean, you know, the content was great. So, but how do you know about the technology? So we went and we got a uh, couple of companies to finance the second season, and we got a second Emmy nod for outstanding interactive program. Wow. And so at this point, we realized that wait a minute. We're generating all this engagement. A typical social media app, it's like a two and a half minute session. Music apps is like 8.9 minute sessions. We did a campaign with Sony Records and it was like 20 minute sessions. And everybody in technology is skeptical, right? They're skeptical unless the information is coming from Russia and it involves Facebook. In which case, we believe everything. <laughs> You've got five million followers, we totally believe it. But if you're a startup, not so much. And so we got this feedback that like, oh, 20 uh, minute user sessions compared to two and a half. That's just because you did it with Sony Records. The artist is already famous. They're discovered by Simon Cowell. They've been on Univision. Of course you got mad uh, interaction. We did World Cup of Hip Hop, 30 minute user sessions with completely unknown bands from the developing world. Why do you think that? Because Ampit does something really special. It gives a voice to the audience. I didn't plan that. No. <laughs> but it was a great alley -oop. Yeah, I like I'm it. I'm here for you. You know, <laughs> she'll be my Steve Kerr. Mm. I'm a bust of Jordan. <laughs> Wait a minute. Old school. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> so, so I'm here every Thursday. Right. Sorry. <laughs> so to, to answer the question, basically, the the thing that was oh, ask the question one more time, actually. Uh, I said, why, why do you, do you think, think that? Is? Why did you get Th so much The reason traction? we got so much, because Ampit makes the audience have a place, a role to play. So it wasn't just like, oh, here's a thing. We push it out to you, watch. The whole world is like, broadcast, 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 watch. Even when you think about the digital innovators, like Netflix and Amazon are still broadcast. We watch. Mm. But we're in a broadband world. It's two ways. So what we said is, oh, these artists have content up here. You decide who gets cast. You decide who's in the show, who are we going to shoot, what city it's going to be in. You decide who's going to come to the finale in Miami. And if you are one of the top fans, you're going to go with them. The number one fan in that first season was a 14-year-old girl from Medellin who won an all-expense-paid trip with her daddy to go to Miami, her first time out of her home country, because she supported her favorite band. So there were a couple of dynamics. One is, oh, I want to win. But the second is, oh, you want to know where I come from, what matters to us? It's mm -hmm. about more than guns and girls. Look at that one, look at that one, look at this. And when you give the audience a sense of participation, then it's not your show, it's their show. And they blew it up. Is that maybe why you think the, well, a lot of those talent shows, your American, the voting process, that maybe they're also successful, more successful than they might be if you're just watching? I think it's always stronger if you can interact. Interaction. And I think that what sets uh, TBTM, Take Back the Mic Apart, is that it doesn't involve a celebrity deciding if you're cool enough. Cool. It's literally the kids in your community are like, this is what we think is fresh. And that can range from like the people who've been in the show. There was this one artist who was literally, um, uh, he didn't have internet access. He just had a cell phone. He'd never been in a studio. He recorded YouTube videos of himself on his phone, rapping on the floor in his little house in a l village in the northwest corner of Dominican Republic with no paved roads. 
It was more like a hut. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And then he went fa- like house to house and got people to like amp and share his stuff because amp it rewards the engagement. You can't vote. You have to actually do something. And it just blew up. And we're like, where is this kid from Esperanza? Where's Esperanza? Mm-hmm. So like the super underground bubbled up. And at the same time, we had one artist come on and we started getting emails from everyone else like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Is so and so in it? Is so and so in it? Is so and so in it? We're like, well, yeah, I guess so. What's the deal? This dude came on, turns out he's the number one battle MC in the Spanish language on the planet. Mm. And he heard about it, he thought it was fresh, and like, like he's got millions of fans, so all these kids from all around the world were like, ping, that's hot. So all of a sudden you have this thing where like, if you're a celebrity, you wouldn't know to look at these people. But if you ask the youth, they already know what's hot. Right. Uh, Lucia, talk to us about this new term you've created, crowd lighting. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, So crowd lighting is a phrase we coined because basically something that Ampit allows you to do is We've, you know, the we're all in Hollywood, so we know what green lighting is, right? You, you green light a project and it gets to air, right? So we're, um, we combine the idea of green lighting with crowdsourcing. So instead of waiting for an executive to green light your content, the fans green light it with a um, critical mass of engagement. So if you have on Ampit, if you're if you upload a video, if it gets 25 amps in 24 hours, Amp is a share that goes to your Facebook and Twitter. If it gets 25 amps in 24 hours, it gets to stay on the site. Otherwise, it gets flushed out of the system, and that is a kind of crowd-controlled quality control, if you will. Does everyone understand that how that works? Yeah. Kind of makes sense. So I have a question, just because y- you just told me this. So. Really quickly, because I, I want to make sure everybody gets uh, room to share. It's just this is a, a kind of a new concept, so I wanted to give them some time to explain it uh, carefully. But tell us about this camp, the June 5th, right? Okay, thanks so much, Simone. So, yeah, so June 5th is the California primary. So we, uh, we got the kind of engagement we got with the World Cup of Hip Hop. And, you know, my background as an organizer made me want to try that with political candidates. So right now we're doing a, we just launched today a campaign called The Audacity of Now for Senate candidate Kevin De Leon, who is challenging Dianne Feinstein in the primary. And um, he's a, a younger uh, Chicano candidate with some really great ideas. He introduced single payer, a uh, bill for, to get single payer for California. He's strong on climate change, immigration, LGBTQ and rights. And entertainment. And, and entertainment. <laughs> he Because he represents the LA area. And so basically, he did this video saying, you know, what does the audacity of now mean to you? What are you doing in your community to create change? And, um, and so young people, anybody, but obviously young people like to use the internet more, uh, can upload their video responses saying what they're doing in their community. And the video with the most watches and shares at the, on, by the primary on June 5th will get to have a video chat with Kevin De Leon. And then the fan who watched and shared the most will get a video shout out from him. All right. That's re- really, I'm excited to see how your platform is going to work with political everything on so many levels it thank pretty you. much is entertainment these days right um thank you guys for sharing um any questions about what they're doing or their background what about how did you guys you both went to you're both very bright let's just put it that way <laughs> very good schools very highly educated how did you is was it the seeing the power of the new tools and technologies and I know Derek has worked in areas that I work in and I'm interested in like virtual reality and but how different is it for you to go from journalism broadcasting political activism theater Mm -hmm. to now your startup co-founders of a tech company yeah, so it's interesting because for me, I feel like my background in entrepreneurship goes way back because I started off as a musician. And my first lesson in entrepreneurship was how to make sure that I got paid after the gig. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. Yeah, easier said <laughs> than done. 
Um, and, and literally, you find that, like, wait a minute, I have to learn how to build kind of like a business plan because the drummer wasn't going to do it, the bassist wasn't going to do it, um, and so somebody had to do it. And so myself and Jonathan started running the business of that. Then we started expanding and doing other things. Then we started figuring out, oh, how we could do music stuff to consult with these people. And then we were both kind of geeks. And so we started figuring out all these cool technology things. So ironically, what we do, like yes, we've had a chance to work with Spielberg and Oprah and all of these people, but the lessons that are most salient to what we do now were learned on the grassroots just from figuring out how to go from I have an idea to how can I bring it into the world. And then we had one music video that blew up all around the world pre-YouTube. And we realized like, oh my God, we charted in all these countries like right after Beyonce. And we don't know who any of the people are who watch it. And for Beyonce, it's okay because she's got a huge uh, infrastructure behind her and she can keep it pushing. But for us, we're like, that information is golden. How do you solve that? And that is literally why we built you technology. You wanted the analytics. You exactly. wanted to understand who your friends, fans, and followers were and have control of that information. Yeah, yeah like, like you put up a video on YouTube right now, right? right. I'm going to give you a true story. I'll hide the names to protect the guilty. This guy does a thing with a big celebrity. They got 40 million views on YouTube. I talked to them about their next project. What's your biggest challenge? Oh, my God, we're really nervous. We don't have an audience. I'm like, you just got 40 million views like a month ago. I do you mean you don't have an audience? Oh, well, Facebook and YouTube will tell you how many people watched. They won't tell you who they are. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Simone, if I could quickly add something about that, because uh, in October we did a panel here, and uh, there was a representative from SAG, I believe, mm -hmm. SAG AFTRA Union, and he was talking about how the challenge is they have some funny algorithm to try to guesstimate the residuals and right. royalties and back end percentage. Uh, for shows that air on Netflix and Amazon, for example, um, because they don't share the data, right? And there's no Nielsen box for that, which in itself is already very generalized information. And so, like, if people could um, air their content on Ampit, they could know how many people are watching, how much they watched, uh, you know, what who they shared it with, what content they really like, what's motivating them, and all those things. And then they would be able to more accu accurately not only remarket to people, but actually pay the people who create the content. That's a really good point. I remember how many, I'll get you in a second. I remember how many times I've had actor friends ask me if they've, have I seen their commercial because they're not paying me and mm. I might be in a different market than them and I'll email, I, I saw it. I mean, that's how. We have an actual advisory council member who does a little bit of that kind of work for a living, um, sort of forensic accounting for the entertainment industry and for artists. Did I get that right? Cool. What's your question? Um, it's probably a really silly, simple question, but is this an app or a website? It's a, it's a great question. She said, is this an app or a website? So it's, we a, mobile, we're webcasting, folks. it's a mobile optimized web application, and it's designed so that it can actually wrap any kind of content. So the cool thing about Ampit is people can use it like on our site, but it's not designed to be like a new Facebook. Ampic can power your content anywhere. You can use it for content on your website or on a blog or to syndicate it to all kinds of different places. So because it's embeddable. It is, exactly. So it's not something you don't have to download anything to use it. A user comes to your site, they just watch a video. But you can push messages through the player. Log in to come backstage. Log in to meet so the band. Got, log in to win a chip. Does that make sense? Yeah. Same question. How, okay, how do you so, monetize it? Ah. So <laughs> right now, we have a, a partnership with ITV, uh, which is a big production distribution company, to sell Ampit Powered content to major media companies. So that's one, the initial monetization. Um, and then what's going to happen is those deals are with larger companies that kind of draw a big audience. And that will give us enough of a base that we can start having platform revenues, which are probably in about 12 months. Like in a YouTube model? It like kind of, but it's a little bit different. Like what it becomes is almost like does everybody know what a Bloomberg terminal is? Okay, so a Bloomberg terminal is basically something that they use in finance to track the markets. Like everybody in Wall Street has access to a Bloomberg terminal, see what's happening in the markets worldwide, right? Imagine a Bloomberg terminal for media and entertainment where you can configure, I really need to know what's on and popping with like kids age 18 to 27 who love sneakers in Tokyo and are really big on EDM. 
and it will give you real time analytics on the trends and what's hot and what they listen to and what they love and da 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 da. And you could configure that for whatever you want to know all around the world. That's the ultimate business model is that brands and media companies will want to understand the audience Demos. and they will basically sign up for the technology. And pay, to do that. Like, pay to you see you guys can't see exactly. this, but a guy in the back, his head just went. Pfft. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. It's not. W it's not webcast. <laughs> so, uh, apology. Uh, can we, if it's a question about Ampic, can we say just so I can get all the panelists in? That's my moderation job. It's a little challenging. Okay. <laughs> Just for some, I would have gotten a hook for you in a second. <laughs> Bring him up. So Alma Derricks, the founder and managing director of Rev, which is behind you, by the way, your information. So you don't, Full but if you could things. give us a briefing, because you have a very dynamic, interesting background and worked on a lot of things. And I think some of what Derek and Lucia are doing has some relevance. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so Rev is my company. It's my umbrella company to do all sorts of projects and consulting. Um, it's been around since 2001. I actually formed it after the last internet crash, the big one, in 2000. Mm. Um, back when, um, if you had e-experience, you had to purge it from your resume and from your bio. No one wanted to talk about e or i or any of the vowels because <laughs> yeah. I had lost a lot of money on this through the 90s. Mm. And so it was my, um, you know, I've, I've kept it in force since 2001. I've had other full-time jobs along the way, but I keep it as my umbrella as a place to house projects and things that I'm working on individually. So it has a nice long track record now. Um, it has insurance. It has a credit line. It has all sorts of things that, that just allow me to empower and projects. And are these that some I of the do. projects you've worked on through Rev? Like sure. Um, so the TV One and yeah. Dilbert. Okay. Sure. Um, so. Um, and, in, and, and, and I can expand that into some of the other consulting I've done. In general, um, when I came out of school um, a little bit er, er, earlier compared to my other panelists, um, you know, this was pre-internet. Um, I was a media kid. We had the cable head end at my high school, so we were producing live TV um, in the high school. And so I started with an interest in broadcast journalism and sort of going in that direction. Um, by the end of senior year, I re it finally struck me. I'd had a number of internships and started to learn the industry, but it occurred to me by senior year that it finally sunk in, I would have to move to Great Butt, Butt North Dakota to start my career if I wanted to be on air. Mm. I didn't want to move to Great Butt, North Dakota. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and, and partially because, you know, you also have to recognize with, with um, anything on air, whether it's talent, whether it's acting, these are cast roles. And so you have to wait for someone who looks like you to die in the next bigger market to have a chance to step into that role. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to chase that. Um, so I knew I wanted to stay in media, but um, but decided I didn't want to chase the, the on-air piece. It still comes back, you know, it's, it's also valuable. Um, I've done thousands of presentations, whether it's in boardrooms or things like this. So all the time spent on air and cutting and producing comes back to comes back to benefit you anyway. Um, but in short, what I started to do after that was I took a turn toward the business side, um, ended up doing an MBA, and came out of B-School in the early 90s, just as Netscape was about to launch. Mm -hmm. So this is the early, early days of the Jurassic days of the internet. And the big turn for me was wanting to jump out on that new platform. So very much like the kinds of things that you're doing with Ampit, you know, in those days, this was CompuServe and AOL and Prodigy and things like that. And because I had all three running on a laptop, I was some sort of internet genius, <laughs> is how that, how that worked. And so I jumped out on this whole, you know, I, I jumped out, threw a shingle out and said, I'll be a new media consultant. Um, had no idea what that meant, but it did mean that probably still my favorite project of all was um, launching, for the Dilbert comic strip, launching the Dilbert Zone mm -hmm. back in 94. Four, something like that, four months after Netscape release, we were up and on. And wow. it was um, a really phenomenal time. And the thing that I take away from your story that I think is very true, especially as you're looking at this industry, there's not a lot I can tell you about those days 15, 20 years ago that are anything more than street cred and interesting history because the rules have changed so much. But one of the things that's true is that when you see those tools, you have to be adept at thinking through the business pieces of it, which you know they both describe to you about about their business and thinking through how to put you know, connect different dots 
and find ways to put things together. Back in the 90s, you know, you couldn't even you couldn't even center text in HTML. That's how rudimentary these days were. Mm. But the thing that we did learn was how to connect with audiences. We launched the site with 50,000 people on day one. It made us the number one site on the whole internet awesome. back in the day. But the thing that I learned that was most important and I think hasn't changed, and Ampit just, and the technology today allows you to magnify this, is the fact that those interactions and the open channel that you've created with consumers is the most valuable thing there is, and also the most confounding thing to, to any sort of traditional business. Media companies don't know who their viewers are. They broadcast out and it rains down on you. They know nothing about you. Um, advertisers, similarly, live in a space where they are wholesalers. As much as they need to support media platforms and get a message out to you about diapers and cars and hamburgers, they are still largely, especially if you're a P&G or a grocery store brand, you're largely a wholesaler. They send things to Ralphs and Kroger and they sell things to you, but they're not touching you individually either. And so what's really dramatically shifted in the media landscape is this two-way conversation, is the fact that there is a continuous loop and the expectations that that sets for content, for news, um, even just for expectations around companies and the transparency that's required now. Um, if you're, a, if you're a, a standing company, everyone knows everything about you. How is it that we know the name of a company like Foxconn, when, you know, who builds Apple mm -hmm. cell phones? How would you have ever known who their manufacturer was in China, hmm. but for the internet? That kind of transparency, and we were just talking about this for crisis communication, when something goes wrong, you know, pick a crisis of the last two weeks even, the speed with which that that hits Twitter and hits uh, hits social is lightning speed. There's no time to react. There's no time to call a convene a meeting tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. um, so that interacting in that sort of environment is really the thing that's new and something that you have an opportunity to jump on because the rules aren't set. And back in the day with Dilbert, there were no rules of engagement. We were still making up standard banner ad sizes. I remember sitting on the phone with other people who had websites, which is what we started calling them. You didn't even have e-commerce. We just said we were selling stuff. You know, like you were making things up. And I think what you need to do is really get excited about reveling in the lack of rules in the space. Um, well said. Along the way, you know, for me, the kinds of things that I've gotten involved with, you know, especially from the business side of things, being on the marketing side, the branding side. I've also been very much involved with building brand extensions, so things that are adjacent to businesses. So to give you an idea, um, neither not uh, General Mills was an interesting one for TV One. That was um, a product placement based show, um, letting General Mills products be featured in a um, in a cooking show for women who have never cooked, who don't go to the grocery store. <laughs> um, they have fairy godmother helping you cook a romantic dinner, do a a, uh, a, a movie night for your family. But it was an interesting exercise in product placement because it's the one time that I've been able to find that having a named product is actually helpful versus doing the thing where they turn the, the label around on the bottle and just sort of say, you know, frozen cookie dough in your grocery's freezer. We could actually say, if someone's desperate, I need to make cookies for a bake sale, they want to hear the name of the product. Go get some Pillsbury cookie dough, slice it up, and we, we would just say it, and all the products that we use were General Mills-based products. So they um, they uh, sponsored and underwrote this show on on TV One. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, I think to keep in mind too. That's the other piece of it. While you're thinking about putting all the pieces together, understand that advertisers, as media is imploding and changing, still have a need to get the word out about their product. They're struggling to figure out how to do that. They're struggling to figure out how to talk to you. So, and they still write the checks that support a lot of this. They have a need to support ongoing businesses. They have to sell Pillsbury cookie dough. And if TV ads aren't going to get me there or print ads or outdoor, if it's going to be on Facebook, fine. How is it? That's my, my path out to you. But recognize that they still always have a need to build community, to find ways to interact, and now to create real meaning around that. Not just create superficial interactions, but create real meaning. So I end up doing a lot of things now where um, even in the marketing side and the brand 
branding side where I'm building extended businesses. So at Cirque du Soleil, for example, um, I was running sales and marketing in the desert for any show that is nailed down, not the ones that tour around. And I built a whole uh, business for them called Spark, where we were doing corporate training using our theaters and our cast and crew as a laboratory for business training. It was a whole other line of business, all um, uh, you know, new revenue for the company. Lots of tech companies took us up on our offers, so Oracle and Google and lots of companies are really interested in using our space for that. Not the core business, not the core acrobatics, but using the lessons learned about teamwork and customer so I'm experience hearing, and things uh, like that. Usually when I do these panels, yeah. some common themes come out, and sure. today it's going to be entrepreneurism. I, I'm seeing some, but if you think about that, if you're an actor, a producer, a writer, a director, a creative, or a business person in entertainment, you are using all these skills, and when I talk to students, you you have to learn you have to learn how to treat your art or yourself as a business without sacrificing either and that's like a balance beam you have to ride just keep that in mind and <coughs> nine times out of ten it's you know your intelligence your background your training <coughs> all this is this much your your creativity your everything and then luck timing who you know and perseverance right so um, we can't help you with the luck and timing. Put yourself in places like you are today. But the who you know is networking. If you don't know how to do it, start talking to people. You're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, another, that's another conversation. But um, most importantly, your professional life for the students in the audience starts now. Um, change your email addresses. I've seen them all, and they're frightening. Um, <laughs> So you create a LinkedIn, start thinking about where you want to be, and don't be an ass. Because if you work in arts and entertainment, the world comes back to you. It's a global world. It's a digital world. Don't, don't be an ass for the sake of doing well. Just don't be an ass in general. But it will come back to you. <laughs> That's my, my little tidbit. OK, next Great. on our panel, <clears throat> J. Todd Harris, who has been on our panel in the past. I really appreciate you coming back. You know, the police have a song called Too Much Information. Mm. <laughs> I think that's what we're suffering from. Um, I, um, I went to the Harvard of the West, Stanford. Um, uh, and I don't know how my phone works. So I have no idea. I just want it to work. Um, I don't know from technology. I just want it to work. I don't, I don't know from... I just make TV shows, movies, and plays. You're and a storyteller. And I raise money, mm -hmm. like, a, like a fiend. Mm -hmm. And that's really all I do. I, you know, I, from New York, went to Stanford, ran a theater company, went to Stanford Business School on a clerical error. Um, <laughs> <laughs> came down here in 1986. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I started making movies in 94, and I've made 45 movies and had a couple shows on Broadway and have a couple more coming and um, you know have had some very successful movies have had some absolutely ridiculous movies um, uh, and I've raised a fund to focus on branded so I guess we are victims of the brand mm -hmm. yeah. you know when everybody has a brand will brand cease to even matter yeah. if we all have a brand then we'll, it cancels itself what's the out point? So I don't know. Anyway, I'm a victim of it as well. So um, I, fo I focused uh, uh, my energies on raising money to option and develop branded IP because that's what the market wants. And so that's what I do. I, I'm developing things like Danny and the Dinosaur and the Ugly Duckling. And um, I've optioned the rights to make a movie out of Dance, Dance Revolution. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and so that that you know I, I I'm developing a TV show based on a thousand and one Arabian Nights. Uh, sometimes I option stuff and spend money on screenplays. Sometimes I look for uh, public domain IP that people haven't thought about repurposing in a certain way. So you know the things that are most interesting that I've done. You know not all of them really are branded. I mean I was an pro exec producer on The Kids Are All Right. Um, I, I was a producer on, a co-producer on this ridiculous movie called Jeepers Creepers. Um, I was a producer on an even more ridiculous movie called Dudley Do Right, branded IP. Um, and um, I recently the, was talking to Joe Layden, the Variety, who sent me his glowing review of Dudley Do Right. I was like, "What were you on?" <laughs> um, and so, uh, and and. Um, 
you know, I was also an executive producer on Piranha 3D, making the world a better place. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but with that, when you make money, you can put it back into passion projects. Can so you anyway, uh, I'm trying to make them feel that, you know, that, that that's essentially what I do. My the Broadway stuff has been Dr. Shivago, American Psycho, and Off Broadway Heather's, wow. which is now playing uh, in London in a few weeks. And so I, I just like I like I like movies. I like plays. I, I, I like TV. There's just too much of it, but I, I like it and I want to make it. So um, that's really that's really that is really really you know just I'm analog Todd. Just call me analog, analog. Todd. So analog. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. One, when you look for projects, is it just what catches your eye in the moment, or do you have a, a plan? And also your thoughts on the media convergence, you know, film and television and Amazon, they're all converging into one digital platform, or are they? Right. Light and fluffy question. My, my investors want me to focus on branded intellectual property, and they want me to focus on things that are franchisable and that have an identifiable audience. I think we should all think about the audience we're making stuff for, mm -hmm. but uh, I've made some movies where that had no audience, and I didn't think about that until after they were done. Um, you know, I've always envied my wife. She's a songwriter, and, and you know, you can sit down and fuss about in the studio for four or five hours, come out with a scratch track, and if it sucks, you lost the afternoon. I can spend two years on a movie, and if it sucks, I want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, I so from from a from a branded point of view, I am looking for material that will resonate with a really wide audience. And when I say branded, I'm not talking about, you know, brand name products. I'm talking about things that you understand, things that have a, a resonance in the in your memory bank. You know, Dudley Do Right did, and and you know, I've been trying for years. Uh, to get the rights to Babar, if you get it, I'll kill you. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, but you know, but I, I've been, you know, that I think Babar has a, a very special place in all of our psyches. Mm. I was trying for a couple of years to to do something with Beetle Bailey and May Still Again, even though it seems old and dusty. Look, so did Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. until Guy Ritchie got a hold of it, right? Mm -hmm. Who wanted the guy smoking a pipe with a funny hat? Mm -hmm. But Guy Ritchie made that interesting. On the other hand, I, I tend the movies I really like and and think are are life changing are um, uh, movies that, you know by that that are made by the Coen Brothers or you know uh, you know or Three Billboards or the m movies that really that really are about the human condition and that that's those are the movies I like and occasionally those come to me and I will make a little exception and find an extra time in my life to work on them. As far as the convergence of technologies is concerned, um, I mean, I, if I were coming into the business today, since this is a university class, <laughs> I would be very, very, very focused on, on, on whatever we call TV. My son watched four, four years of Breaking Bad on his phone. But, um, so I guess that's a TV. But I, I would be, they're, they're, now we get to tell stories in 10 hours or 20 or 30 or 40 hours and, and instead, of, instead of two hours. And so um, is, is it converging? Yeah, I mean, yes, it's harder and harder than ever to get people out to see a movie. I love seeing three bill, billboards at a screening. I love seeing, you know, Call Me By Your Name at a screening. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I could have watched those on the 65 inch screen in my office and been okay. Mm -hmm. Now get out. Mm. I can't go to the sunken place in my living room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta Unless go you're see. Kanye. You, you know. <laughs> nice. Who lives in the sunken place. Exactly. <laughs> nice. So I, I mean, I, I just, you know, it, it's, as, a, as many of us in this room are, are lovers of movies and, and you know, I, I, when, when, you know when, when, when my kid said, you know, I said, let's go to the arc light and see Life of Pi. My kids are, Dad, you're getting the screener. And I said, shut your mouth. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to see Life of Pi in three, yeah. goddamn 3D, and we're yeah. going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what's going on. That's a lot, yeah. So um, on that note, I recommend, I think you will very much enjoy a movie about to come out um, that is called Sorry to Bother You, um, that oh, people are nodding their head, um, by um, a filmmaker, Boots Riley. Um, it's amazing, and it's twisted, and it's dark, and Anna Purna picked it up after Sundance, and 
very Bay Area meets the sunken place. That's what I'm going <laughs> to say. But you have to see it on a big screen because it's got a lot of, and music is paramount But, in this but film. seeing Get Out on the big screen was about the audience, yeah. the group yeah. reaction. Yeah. That's true, that's true. It, it was this chance, one will yeah. do that too. It was a chance to freak out I'm in unison. So. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, next, we have the lovely Laura Rodriguez, who works for the Recording Academy Grammy Awards. Anybody know what that is? Just wondering if you've heard of it before. So, um, I met Laura. Laura's a, a Cal State graduate. Um, one in 10 people in this state who are working went to the CSU. It is the largest public university system in the world, pretty much. Pretty, I know, people you don't even, I, th I mean, Steven Spielberg, I mean, I could go on and on. I'm not going to. We're going to talk about Laura and her work and how she more recently than some other people on the panel, which is why I'm so glad she was able to join us transition from student to this really great job that you have? Yeah, so I grew up here, um, 26 miles away from here in El Monte. Um, I always wanted to be in entertainment. I just didn't know what part of entertainment I wanted to, to, to start my career. So I decided to go to community college. Even when I was in community college, I was taking journalism classes, I was taking TV film classes, and I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. It wasn't until I transferred to Cal State Fullerton where I really decided that I love storytelling. I love to write, and I was trying to figure out a path of where I can do that. I decided to major in communications, minor radio, TV, and film, and ultimately I decided, well, I want to be a publicist. I want to be the one making the shots, make call, you know, talking to reporters, you know, being the voice of someone who is actually busy creating art. Long story short, I interned at Focus Features, NBC Universal, um, a photography agency. Then I interned at the Recording Academy. Granted, at that time in 2013, when I graduated, social media was still new. Back in 2008, when I graduated high school, Twitter was fairly new too. It was like two years old, two years or something like that. I didn't even have a smartphone. I couldn't afford a smartphone. Then when I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, um, that is when I started really using social media. And at that time, Instagram was even new. I used to use Instagram as a, as a photo editor um, app where I used to edit my photos and then I would you know, upload them to Facebook and Twitter. So when I started at the Recording Academy in 2013 as an intern, social media was still fairly new to the Academy. Um, we were not live tweeting shows, as you probably know a lot of live award shows, live tweet, live post, and also a lot of um, competition shows. So when I started at the Recording Academy, I actually helped build our voice. And what I mean by that, I mean the voice of the recording industry. As you know, the recording the Recording Academy, the Grammys, is a pure award show. And by that, I mean that only certain industry professionals get to vote. It's not the fans. And so what I did, and I helped cultivate the voice, is really telling the stories of music professionals, utilizing our platforms to really amplify the voice. Not only that, but be the authority of the Grammy Awards. So you always see a lot of brands you know, stating facts. People were stating facts about our organization, but in reality, we were the authority. I'll give you an example. At the 58th Grammy Awards, when, um, when Adele won for her album, people, you know, Billboard, Variety, everyone was saying, you know, she's the only female who's won album of the year, when in reality, she wasn't. That was our place for us to really tell the story and tell, tell the facts. And so what I've done at the Recording Academy is I helped build that, but also a lot of people don't know that we also have other charities that we work, that we actually that, a lot of other it's up charities. on the screen right now. <laughs> yes. So we, you know, there's also Music Cares Museum, and 
We also advocate on behalf of music creators. Um, we advocate on outdated music laws. A I think we touched on this, where there are a lot of producers, songwriters, who are not getting the royalties that they deserve because of outdated laws. And so what we do on Capitol Hill is we set up meetings with members of Congress to really push forward for legislation. The most recent one that you can probably look up is the Music Modernization Act. And that that actually passed the House, and we just had a hearing two weeks ago that Smokey Robinson, ASCAP, BMI, Sound Exchange were all in the room, and so was the Recording Academy. And we told the stories of songwriters, producers who are creating the music to our lives, who are not getting paid. And so through social media, we amplify those voices. Think about all the accounts that you follow. You follow them because something that they post gravitates to you, right? Just think about it. And so that's what we're trying to do with the Recording Academy. We want to make sure we amplify the voices. Nice. I have nothing to say, but <laughs> that was awesome. Um, though I do have a question for you. I, mean, I don't think in your head when you, you interned at Focus, sounds like you did at least two internships. Yeah. How, it seems like to me, you wouldn't be where you are now unless you did that internship at the Grammys. Yeah, wait, I'm sorry. So you interned at Focus and uh, then you interned at? Yes, so what I did is, I mean, even when I w I'm first generation, so my parents don't know what an internship is, let alone did they teach me what an internship was. So when I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, they had an amazing internship program, and a lot of my peers were asking me, oh, where are you interning? Where are you interning? And I looked at them like, what are you talking about? Mm. I don't know what an internship is. Um, and so I, um, you know, I started building up my resume. I went to the... Um, to the internship office at Cal State Fullerton, and I applied to literally every internship that there was. Thankfully, at Focus Features, there was a Cal State Fullerton alum. Oh, it yes. is the networking who you and know, so, one in 10 thing. And so before that, I had two internships. They were not in entertainment at all, but I had built my skills. So when I went to the interview, I really do think that you know it was about personality it was about what I was gonna bring to the table and eventually I got the internship there that internship after it was done I didn't go back because I wanted to try something different before I graduated so then I went to um, CBS when I was at CBS I interned for two three months I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do it was my last semester and I really wanted to get a job. And so I started applying to other internships and thankfully I saw the one opening at the Grammys. Granted, I just knew the Grammys from the TV show, you know, watching it with my family, listening to the music. I was like, okay, the Grammy Awards is so flashy, I definitely <laughs> want to intern there. So then I got the job. And I got the job, I got actually the internship. The thing is that when I was at the internship, I literally, talk to everyone on the floor. I was always the one who was like, do you need help with this? Do you need help with that? I was going above and beyond. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, if there's a template, let's use a template. Let's be very strategic. Um, you know, and like I said, at that time, I was a social media intern, so I was always on social. I was always the one saying, well, let's do this, well, let's do that. And at that time, I mean, you see now we have Facebook Live, Instagram Live, Instagram Stories. Um, at that time, nothing, nothing like that was out. You had to do it yourself. Yes, and so I've, Grew, I really grew up with the social media as it's evolving back in 2013. It's heavily involved, evolved. You made yourself indispensable, and that's something I always say. Make yourself indispensable. Why, why are you wasting your time? Question. I'd love to understand um, social media is used by pretty much every large organization, especially in times of crisis management. So um, I can imagine that after the last Grammys, um, your position may have become a little bit more challenging than you would have expected. Um, how, I'd love to hear how that went for you, and then also, um, you know, some of the, the organizations that the Recording Academy is involved in. Is there any plans to become more involved with the Women in Music uh, organization? I mean, I don't know if you can answer that, but. 
Yeah, I can't really speak on that, but I would say as far as social media, you know, we, social media, one thing that, you know, social media is a new PR. So when you, when, when something like that happens, you have to really take, your PR team has to take lead. So in that instance, we took as a social media, we took lead from, from our communications department. Now granted, from a social media perspective, what you can do is you can pull reports. There's specific social media analytic tools that literally pull in every post you can think of. Um, Simply Measured and SpreadFast are really great tools that we utilize. So, you know, we can search keywords like anything with our president, anything with women. We can pull in and send those reports to our PR team and then they can literally uh, more assess the situation on social. As far as women in music, we have, and it's been publicly said and it's been public, publicly published, um, we have built a woman task force. Um, and that, I mean, that is going to, it's going to be something that we're going to really be at the forefront of. Okay, sounds like hashtag you too. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Thank you for your question. Certainly not least, but definitely last today, we have Nick who is, I, I can't say enough of how interesting his background is and um, his most recent project as well because it's, he's um, one of the screenwriters on it and it's based on a very personal family story. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on I'm now? I'm not even sure if I'm in the right room after all. Yes, you room. are. Yeah. You are definitely. I should you, be, be sitting are. out there. Uh, I guess I'm here for the latest thing that uh, no also your background well Mm -hmm. background is I've been out here a long time maybe 30 years or so and started as an actor wrote a script luckily got it made and then just been banging around making some good some bad mostly bad little independent movies and uh, I was never really in the studio world Uh, actually running it to uh, Todd, we, I almost did a project with him that we just realized like maybe 25 years ago. Shh, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, years ago. I was 10. Again, don't um, be an uh, ass, people. Don't so, be an ass. So I've been waiting since then to get another meeting with him. And I just <laughs> don't, just, uh, so I, I did a lot of this. acting and writing and just, you know, uh, I just started uh, cold calling people. I never really had an agent or a manager. And everything I got done, I just, out of just trying, you know, mm. so. If there's anything out of my stories, just don't give up and keep trying. But I, I had this particular project that I had my whole life because it's a true story that happened to my dad. And the other person involved in it didn't want me to tell it until after he had passed away. So I always knew this thing was, I, at least I thought it was gold, but I respected that man's wishes. And um, he did pass away a few years ago, so I decided to, uh, to move forward with it. And um, I should have called you then. (laughs) So long story short, a friend of mine, I was telling him the story. We were talking about doing something together. He goes, what are you going to do next? And I said, I'm going to make this little thing. I don't care if I have no money. I'll make it with my iPhone and a meatball sandwich. And I'll just, (laughs) I was going to do it like that, a very small version of it. And he uh, was friends with uh, the director, Peter Farley, who from The Dumb and Dumber, uh, all those movies. And this is a drama. So he said... I want to pitch this to Pete, and I didn't. Uh, first, I was like, "Well, he does comedies," but I met Pete, and uh, he was amazing. And he said he was looking for this type of a drama his whole career. And of course, this was so personal to me; it was something I wanted to direct and do. But you know, you reach certain decisions in life. When I met Pete, I said, "No, he's the guy. He can do this." It, I knew he could. It, it would it would be fantastic with him. And I thought I'll get it to a different level if I do it with him. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I wrote the script with uh, my friend and then with Pete, his director's past, we all did together. I'm a producer on it, and it's uh, briefly a true story about my father that happened in the early 60s. He used to be a bouncer at the Copacabana nightclub in New York, lived in the Bronx, and they used to close the Copa, so he he used to pick up an extra job once in a while. So he was asking around, has anyone got known any jobs? Someone said a doctor needs a driver. He went to the address, and it was Carnegie Hall. And he said, oh, this must be a mistake. And he asked, they said, no, the doctor lives above Carnegie Hall. And he went up to this uh, interview, and there's this amazing room with a grand piano and chandeliers, a throne, African tusks, uh, just 
crazy artifacts. And he said, I'm in the wrong place. And this uh, man came out, African man with a, with a robe. And my father said, well, what kind of doctor are you? And uh, he said, no, I'm not that type of doctor. I have doctorates. And uh, he was a concert musician. And he was going to do a tour of the South in 1962. So you couldn't have two different guys. My father was one of, you know, basically Tony Soprano meets, uh, <laughs> this guy's a genius, spoke eight languages. And I guess he had, he knew going in the South, he was going to have some possible problems. He played for rich, elite, white people only, and uh, he was going to do this tour. So he took my father. My father drove him and kind of watched over him. And it's about their relationship and then what happened in the South in 62, having this man who would play at these amazing places for these rich, the governors, and then couldn't go to the bathroom in the same place he was play, playing at. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of that. So it's also about their relationship. And long story short, uh, got, got it done, and um, participant media, media and Amblin, uh, Spielberg's company, picked it up. Uh, they, they funded it, and Viggo Mortensen is playing my dad. And, and who's playing the pianist? I have it up there. Mahershal Ali. Yes. Oh, wow. Everyone remember Moonlight? Yes. Yeah. So uh, to, to get it they at that level. They won an Academy Award. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like someone. Anyway. So we got to film it. Uh, we just we just locked picture. We filmed it uh, between November and February uh, this year. And um, it's going to come out between Christmas and um and uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, did you get to go? Did you get to be on set? Oh, I was. I, I'm a producer on it, so I, I I've been involved. The thing about Pete was, especially because it was my family, uh, I was there for everything. I mean, Vigo practically lived with me and my family for almost nine months before we wow. shot. He, you're not gonna. He put on like 50 pounds. He's a different guy, you know. But wow. when I, I I wanted an, an Italian guy to play my father, I thought that was very important. Mm -hmm. But when Vigo came up, and that was Pete had it. It was Pete's idea. And at first, everyone's like, well, he's not. But I said, you know what? The most iconic Italian in movies is The Godfather, Brando. Mm. He wasn't Italian. Mm -hmm. So to me, Vigo's our Brando. Mm. That's awesome. So well, I said, acting. sure. And he, uh, yeah, congratulations. Anyway, he's unbelievable in it. Mahershal is off the charts in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very your, lucky. Has your family that. seen it? I actually had family members in it. Uh, How did they get those parts? So all the family scenes have my real family. Like my I brother, like my That's brother, amazing. who's not an actor, but my brother plays Vigo's brother. He plays my uncle. That uncle, cool. who's now 80s, plays their father. Wow. Uh, That's my amazing. mother's brother plays their father, mm. grandfather. Uh, uh, Linda Cardellini plays my mom. That's and. So cool. um, he cast me as a mob guy in the movie. I don't, I don't know why. I, get it. <laughs> I couldn't even play a member of my own family. But uh, is, is, the, is the musician doctorate guy? A, no, he uh, passed away. That's the, oh, he, that's he, oh, yo, he wanted to wait. Until he's the one who wanted. I had this, you know. Do my you know whole why life. he wanted to wait? There's things in in the story that I, uh, okay, I can understand why okay. he might have wanted. It. It's a different era that I don't want to reveal yet. But I respected him, so I was. I was waiting. How about waiting. his family? Meanwhile, I was making a lot of crappy movies in between. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's all right. Everybody's how, how about journey. His, how about his family? Uh, he, he doesn't have. A, uh, I researched his family. We we've got, we're in contact with his uh, executor of his estate. They know about it, and um, but I had done. I had met with him years ago, so I got his side of the story as well. Always mm -hmm. uh, I, on top of my father's side of the story. So wow. um, that's the best story I heard all day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Can you explain the title? It's oh, it's called Green Book because see, the photo there? that in that photo there was a thing they had in, from the 30s to the 60s called the Negro Motor Screen Book, and it was. horrible thing but a good thing where African Americans could eat stop oh. get gas crazy so that's a part of the film mm. yay yes wow question I think it might be it's actually more of a comment I know about the green book 
Mm. My dad was a civil rights activist. Oh, wow. mm. I grew up in um, an African American neighborhood in Columbia, South Carolina. I went to the AME church. Um, and when we would travel as a little kid with some of his students, we had to use the Green Book. Mm. Wow. Your film is so important mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. They did a couple test screenings of just the rough cut, and I got to say, a lot of the younger people that w were in there that were, you know, brought in by these tests, uh, they couldn't even believe what they no, saw. It was like it was another planet. It was almost as if it was like from the uh, the, the the Civil War, but yet it's mm -hmm. only fifty. Six, wow. 50 years ago mm -hmm. so I think on that level I mean I didn't you know I, I wanted to get all this out but you don't think I, I didn't think about that purposely I'm just trying to tell the best story that I could tell but that's part of the story so it needed to be in there so uh, you know the n-word is in there a lot of stuff a lot of people were shocked that just the common usage of this word and, and all this stuff but I felt it has to be in there because it's historical and we need to tell this to show this can never happen again. Thank you. For Thank you for sharing that. I just want you to know when I hear Nick, I mean, I'm from Jersey, my dad's from the Bronx, I'm just home again when I <laughs> listen to your voice and I can go there so quickly, you have no idea. <laughs> trained actor, but I can talk like a Jersey girl whenever you want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to Don't thank everybody. Oh. Yeah, I'm from Jersey, too. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Jersey in the house. I feel you, Nick, and I, I just can just imagine you going from this guy living above Carnegie Hall in this beautiful house mm -hmm. where he got to live there, yeah. and then wanting to go down and it's do beautiful. what he loves, even though he's, yeah. he's oppressed down there. It's, yes. It's amazing. It's really, it's inspiring. <laughs> it changed my father's life, changed how we were brought up. Like I said, I always knew I had to tell the story, and I just waited until the time was right. And I got lucky. I mean, I got, like I said, I wanted to direct it, but I got Pete. The I directing's am I met Pete Farrelly. Yeah, the, 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 the movie's amazing. The actors are off the charts. It's, it's uh, one of my yeah, it's, um, hopefully it'll, you know, get out in, into the world and, uh, Go see it. Tell people yeah, to go see it. Right. Oh. Yeah. You better press your tuxedo, brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Oscar voters. This is going to be <laughs> intense. Do we have any questions about anything we talked about? Anything from the students? I, I thought there's a broadcasting student here from San Francisco State, and I thought some of the things um, Milady said about the idea of going to those little dinkity doink towns to to work as a reporter didn't appeal to her because I hear this from students a lot these days they don't want to that's the journey you have to make to become a broadcast reporter so I thought some of that might, you might respond to <laughs> any question hi I have a question that goes back to Ampit if you could um, I'm trying to wrap my head around if this is something that those of us who are uh, con you know filmmakers or content creators that we can utilize your uh, technology on our site was that part of it yes, yes. Do we have to pay you <laughs> uh, that's a good question yes. very good question <laughs> it's it's can it's talk about how that works a little bit? yeah so it's this th there's a lot of aspects of it but the simplest way to think about it is imagine a video player or something that can wrap around any video player and it can enable you to engage the audience. You can push messages to the person watching. The person can authenticate and say, oh, I like that. Like, I want to participate right from the player. And then there's a bunch of other things that can happen from it. Well, once you do it that way, it means that you can embed the content anywhere. You can embed it on a blog about yoga in Peru and engage with people around that and then you can decide oh snap this is working for me i want to do a whole series about yoga around the world and have videos all over the web and be connecting with people in different languages and managing an audience in a dashboard where you start to connect with them so on the one hand like yeah we have a site where we are able to showcase what it can do but what it's designed to be is an infrastructure that anybody can use and most of the people who engage with it wouldn't even know it's us they'll think it's you you can't use it in Facebook because Facebook will not let us. 
However, we were actually approached by a, an organization doing a really powerful project with a large, uh, I, won't, I won't get into detail, but with a very, very powerful institution that asked if we would do it with them on Facebook. And we're like, well, we can't. They're like, oh, we'll just ask Facebook to, to say it's okay. And we're like, okay, great. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so technically, if you've got the clout to tell Facebook to be like, allow this technology on, then it really will. That said, our initial seed investment came from a, a senior executive at Facebook uh, who was interested in what was going to happen next beyond traditional social media. So we worked closely with their engineering teams when we were building it. You log in with Facebook, you can push a button that will share to Facebook and, and Twitter simultaneously. So it is integrated with social media. Yes. Someone doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like how, yeah, that kind of real-time engagement, is that a capability? So the real-time engagement is exactly what it does. So the way it works is it scores you for watching and sharing. It's like that simple. And there's all this other awesome stuff that happens like, oh, you, you watch this thing, great. How much of it did you watch? You know, if I'm on Facebook right now and I see a video of like my, my baby cousin, and then the background, or a picture of my baby, because in the background there's a video playing, Facebook will be like, that's a view. I'm like, that's not a view, I didn't even see the thing. What Ampit does is it looks at like, did you watch the video? What percentage of it did you watch? Did you share it? Wh what percentage of the people you shared it with also connected to it? And then it enables you to do all these interesting things that are what we call gamification. So for example, like, you can't just share stuff from Ampit all day. You get five of these amps you have to be selective about what you share so we don't spam people. And so when something gets amped, it's because you really believe in it. And then there's all this other stuff where it can tell, oh, you watched, you were person number 10 to watch. Well, what if 10,000 people, people follow you? What happens? I'll give you a simple example of why that matters. Because people are always like, oh, who cares? Like, if you ask people who discovered Justin Bieber, they'll be like, uh, it was on YouTube. Like, okay, well, yeah, but like, who? Okay, uh, Usher? If you ask industry people, they're like, no, no, no Scooter Braun. But if you ask, who are the first three little girls to start sharing his videos with like thousands and then hundreds of thousands of millions of people around the world? Everyone's like, well, I don't know. So industry never knew and never cared. That's what Ampit does. Ampit says that that little girl shared it. She was number five. After 500,000 people shared it or five million, that video creator blows up, that little glo girl blows up too. When you say blows up, what do you what do you mean? <laughs> we are it not blowing up little exactly. girls. We are not for the record and for the FBI. <laughs> we have two little girls. <laughs> so, uh, so what happens is it ranks you based upon your engagement. So you start, it's almost like a role playing game. You start off as like a level one, you know, roadie. And you can rise up and rise up to become a promoter and a level three to v, uh, this and a tastemaker and a level two VIP and a mogul. So what it does is it makes it easy when you're engaging with your audience. You can look and be like, that person is an early adopter and they are a level three tastemaker in such and such a territory around these and these types of content. It enables you to understand the audience. And what that does is it gives the audience power. Because if that little girl is like, I'm a level three tastemaker, normally you would ignore me, but I think that this is hot. Now all of a sudden the content creator or the brand or the advertiser can be like, well if she thinks it's hot, maybe I should pay attention to her. So the principle behind it is, how do you empower the fans? Or when I do my next movie release, I'm going to market to that girl. And if, you know, whoever watches and shares the trailer the most is going to win a ticket to the premiere and they're going to meet the star at, on the red carpet, you know. And so you're going to go straight to that girl because, you know, she's a super influencer on, online, even though she's not famous. How does she know that she's become this super... Because on the... On the site it says she's a level three tastemaker with wait we have a a girl from brazil on the site she's got like i'm, I'm, I'm not she has like seven hundred thousand points on the site and she's you know the the number one fan and you know she won like a computer you know for you know so wow. 
Yeah, there are brands that uh, cooperate or, or content owners that cooperate can designate a prize that they think is really going to incentivize engagement from that fan, like the little girl who got to come to the VIP finale in Miami and meet her, the band that she turned into stars right there at the finale. There's tears. Mm -hmm. There's and tears. <laughs> That's, I'm so <laughs> glad question. you asked that. It's actually really simple. So we keep all the user data anonymous until the user says, I want to participate. So for example, you could be Nike, and you could push out a message being like, yo, 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 everybody come and participate in this campaign to come to the Olympics or to the World Cup or whatever. And if you say, oh, I want to opt in, OK, then Nike knows it's you. And if you're like, eh, I'm not feeling that. I want to opt out. Well, then you're out. So you the control your data. Users control their data. So it's an opt-in, not I have to know to opt-out. Exactly. And we don't share the data with that third parties. That was the missing link before. <laughs> we, we don't share it with Cambridge Analytica or Russia or anybody like that. Yeah. 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 So great. Any other questions? Right there. The, the question is finding projects that you do to make money versus passion projects, right? You want to go first, man? Yeah. I'd say, uh, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. When I first came out here, the first script I wrote was like a big deal, and then it, made, it was made into a film, and it was, they changed a lot of things. But I had a lot of stars. Everyone's telling me, oh, you're going to be this, and Tarant you're the next Tarantino. And then, you know, things happen. And so I, I tried to, like, stick to, I'm just going to make my movies. I'm just going to do my stuff. But then, of course, you have to work, you know. So, And then people tell you, you should do this. Oh, you need to do that. And then I find my, found myself compromising who I was, I thought. I stopped for, like, years I stopped. And then I came back to it did it again and I just wasn't happy with I was just making some movies and some were small and some were okay and some were terrible because I, I, and I, I only blame myself I was never one to be afraid of never be afraid to make something and fail I could care less as long as I know I failed I made a mistake but you don't never know something's gonna be good or bad unless you try it right so you don't set out to make a bad movie but there were times when I knew this isn't that good and I'm being hired to do this, but I'll, I just need to do it. So long story short is a film like this, this is the type of stuff I've always wanted to do. Now, there's room for everything. I like a popcorn movie. I like a horror movie. I like a comedy. I like lots of things. But just to go to your question, I, don't do what you think you need to do because of a trend. Because if everyone's trending this way, then how do you stand out? I always said sometimes I would do stuff and they say, well, you Change it and make it more like this. Make it more like this stuff. I go, why do I want to make it like something that's already been done? I'm never going to stand out, and nothing's going to jump out. How did Get Out become so great? Because it wasn't like the other movies. Mm -hmm. So stick to your beliefs. It's a juggling act. You have to work. You have to get your name out there, but um, just keep trying. I mean, I've been doing this a long, long time, bouncing around, doing a lot of junk. And go go I, rent the big know, picture. <laughs> Old yeah. movie. You'll understand what I mean. Yeah. Hold on. I, I, I would say, just br very briefly to add to that, I think you know Nick said it right, but I mean, um, I, I think if there are uh, some of the movies that have been the most significant movies that I've done and, and, and the most fulfilling to me paid me the least. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. You know, but I, I think, I, th I, you know, I, I am not a big horror <coughs> movie guy. I'm just not. But I, I, you know, the two guys who work for me and with me, they, they are, and I understand the power. You look at the box office, horror movie opens every month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every free, and why? Because people want to see that shit together. Mm. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't want to see it alone. Not me. <laughs> so so I, I, I respect, I, I have great respect for the commerce of it all, and I do get a thrill out of a, you know, a successful venture, even if it's not feeding my soul. And so I think the, the answer is to balance it out 
you know, with if, if I had to just do all stuff that didn't appeal to me, I think that that would be not as much fun. Uh, I mean, uh, but I, I, I like. But I, I'll tell you what. I like. I I like getting out of bed every morning. Some mornings more than others. Mm -hmm. But I like getting out of bed every morning because I like what I do. And that. And you know, I have two teenage sons, and I all I wish for them is that they find something that makes them want to get out of bed mm. every morning. And I think that the, there's a secret. If you want to make a great art film, you can wrap it in a horror film. Because mm -hmm. look at Get Out or look at Guillermo del Toro's movies. Mm -hmm. You can, yeah. if you have a great idea and you wrap it in like a horror genre, you can get away with some really creative stuff. A Quiet Place, absolutely a quiet genius. Place. And also collaboration is important. I want to point out there's a guy uh, standing right behind you who looks a lot like you. Yeah. You guys should work together. I can see a lot of possibilities there. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's a horror movie right there. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to say about that. Do you, <laughs> luckily, you're not dressed like that. would be really frightening. Awesome. Uh, question right here. I'm um, asking a question when you mentioned about branded content. Um, what about pause oriented content do you consider that branded if you're partnering with something like a Planned Parenthood or another organization? That's he, when it's important to me, if I squint hard enough, I say, "This looks branded. This could be branded." I, 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 um, I, I am interested. You know, I optioned a book from my my fund, and I, and it's interesting because this is not what my fund doesn't want me to do. It will not be a franchise. It will not be. It will. It will not be a popcorn movie. You know, uh, well maybe, but um. It's a book called Big Guns by former Congressman Steve Israel, and yes. it is it it is to the gun industry what Thank You to Smoking was to mm. the tobacco wow. industry. It's it's being there. It's the Big Short. It's 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 a it's it's it's, it's a crazy satire about America and about policy and about Washington and about the gun thing. And the gun thing is a really important issue to me. I do not understand this country mm. okay I don't and I, 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 I accept to a degree that it is the way it is so that that to me is it a brand <laughs> you know not, not really now also a true story that I, I optioned was called um, it's called hate a love story and it's the story of the guy who sued the Westboro Baptist Church when they protested his dead military son's funeral and he took them to the Supreme Court Mm. And now that's a true story. Is it branded? It's not cat in the hat, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, the marketing would be targeted in some ways in terms of branding. Who who cares who wants to see that movie kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We can help you with that stuff. It's a question over here. All right. <laughs> Well, I have several pairs of knee pads and tin cups in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I wear them out every week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually... <laughs> oh, my God. The truth, the truth is, is that, um, you know, I, I'm going to answer just because I've done a lot of it. And, and I... Um, uh, if, if some people don't have the ask for money gene, I do. I want a dollar from every one of you before you leave. No, I want, I want, no, I mean, but so it's really hard for certain people to ask for money, and that's a real thing. I get that. There are certain producers that are like, I've never had to ask for money. I'm just like, what do you do for a living? So, um, but I, I um, if it's important enough to you, that, that's, that, that really helps. Because I, I do ask a lot, a lot of people, and I ask, friends and I went to a fancy business school and I asked them but one key is I have found with a couple of movies where I have I don't want to say crowdsourced because that's not really how it is I have found affinity groups for the topic of movie I'm producing mm -hmm. I made a lacrosse movie Crooked Arrows and um, <laughs> it took me three years of, of fancy begging but it was begging and I, every one of my 52 investors 
it was crazy. Invested because they care about lacrosse. You know, and I actually convinced myself that there are enough people who play and care about lacrosse that if I could get enough people to go see the movie, now I did all this crazy math in my head one day, it didn't work out, but um, now I, on Bottle Shock, everybody who's in, who invested in, that's a wine movie, everybody who invested in that movie, 24 investors, thought they were a wine expert. You know, pe people who with too much money, like, oh, why, you want to need $100,000, here you go. You know, so I, I and and there and I think you need to build a convincing business plan. I mean, it doesn't have to be a hundred pages long. It can be eight, ten pages long, and it's real. They're, 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 it's not. It's not a state secret what's in these business yeah. plans. It's really just you know there are eight to ten things that need to be in it. And you need to make a case. You got to convince yourself before you can convince somebody else. Mm -hmm. And and you know and and you then you need to and nobody wants to be your first investor. Nobody wants to be the first person in the boat. That's right. No matter how much you're Tom soaring and hey, painting this fence is fun, you know. But you got to get you got to get the low hanging fruit. The people who who care about you and your subject matter first, and then once a few other people have invested, then it's like, oh, I'm not the first person in the water. Maybe it's not that cold. Mm -hmm. But the first so. person makes the most money usually. Well, yeah, we have, we have anyway, yeah. um, I hate to do that because we're actually over time mm -hmm. and a guy with a hook is here. <laughs> but um, two things. Check out Beyond the Box Office. Uh, it's a book by John Reese about, I mean, early on, about exactly what he's talking about. It's basically like a marketing and distribution business plan for film. Um, I used to use it to teach, but check that out. Check out this, the Hollywood game plan. And um, if you want this PowerPoint, leave your business card here. I will send it to you, because that's how I roll. If you have any questions, uh, be gentle and nice. Uh, do some of you have to take off? We want to be respectful. In a few minutes. Yeah, Who's going to see so Paul Simon tonight? Who's going to see Woo! Paul Simon tonight? Don't yes! think they're being rude if they have to leave. It can be <laughs> awkward to be overwhelmed by you all. You got it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just email you. Yeah, I'm Todd. Yeah, so great to meet you. What's your name?